Okay, good evening and welcome to the City University of London uh, European Social Survey and NatSEN Social Research Method Seminar. Um, we've moved this online due to the current situation, so this is a first try for us. We'd be grateful for any of your feedback about um, what happens with this new webinar format. Um, just a few housekeeping things. Um, we've asked everyone to please turn their video off to increase uh, the bandwidth that we're all using. During the presentation, uh, everyone will be muted, but there is a chat function. So please have a look in the settings, find the chat function. You can leave your questions there and we'll take some of those at the end of the seminar. Um, the lecture will be available uh, online after the seminar, just the actual lecture, uh, not the questions. So I'm just going to unmute our speaker. Gary, can we just check that your sound's working? Uh, yes, uh, I can hear you, Rory. Can you hear me? I can hear you, which should mean hopefully that everyone else can hear. Um, so before we move on, uh, just to introduce our speaker this evening, it's um, Professor Gary Pollock. Uh, who's uh, Head of Sociology at Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, Gary's been involved with youth, res youth research for over 20 years um, and has used survey data to look at young people uh, in society in terms of their social and political outlook as well as employment and family trajectories. Um, Gary's been the co-editor of uh, Radical Futures, Youth Transitions and Activism in Europe a sociological review a monograph series and in recent years has been working towards the development of the European Cohort Development Project through his coordination role of the MyWeb Project and the European Cohort Development Project. So we're now going to hand over to uh, Gary. So if Gary if you could now share your slides and again please do use the chat function if you'd like to, to leave any queries for the end. Over Thank to you, you very Gary. much, Rory. Uh, let me also switch my video on. Um, okay. Hopefully, people can see me now. Um, now, share my screen. So, maybe, Rory, if you could confirm that you can see the first slide. That's great, we can do. Just say to everyone, if you want in your options to choose speaker view uh, rather than the, the kind of grid format, that works well. You'll see the slides in the middle and then Gary uh, to the right with a very nice view of, uh, of Manchester in the background. So over to you, Gary. Thanks very much, Rory. Well, well uh, greetings from Glossop in Derbyshire, actually, but I guess I could be anywhere. Um, and the backdrop, you're quite right, it is Manchester. Uh, Manchester skyline but for anyone who's been to Manchester recently you'll know that that's actually not uh, the current skyline of Manchester we've got a we've got a huge amount of building work going on so the, the, the horizon is full of cranes um, uh, and, and they're calling it Manhattan uh, there's lots of skyscrapers getting built anyway um, on on with the seminar uh, thank you very much Rory for inviting me to do this seminar which of course I was supposed to be doing in person but uh, I'm actually very pleased to be doing it in webinar format. I think that it's a good thing that we do engage with these uh, technologies. We've had them for ages. Why aren't we using them? Um, so let's let's get used to them. Uh, and we'll be forced to get used to them, of course, in relation to the, 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 the current context. So I've got the pleasure to talk to uh, people about um, uh, Euro cohort, uh, what we also call growing up in digital, digital Europe over the next uh, 45 minutes. And then you'll have an opportunity to, to ask me uh, some questions uh, at the end. Um, I've got a, a number of slides. The slides I should warn you, I've got a lot of slides, um, but uh, they are, um, they're, they're visual, they're not text rich slides. And as Rory said at the uh, outset, um, they will be available afterwards. So if I do flick through some of them uh, quickly, then you'll certainly get the opportunity to review them at a, at a later point. So um, so here we are, um, you're a cohort. Uh, first, um, what we call the first uh, Europe-wide longitudinal study to measure child and youth well-being. Um, right, there we are. 
So first of all, then the structure of what, I'm, what the talk's going to be. Um, I'm going to be, uh, first of all, talking about the background to the, the Euro cohort project, what its drivers were, and what we've been doing for a number of years. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, the survey design uh, as it currently stands. Then it's question, the questionnaire content, because we've got some um, draft questionnaires already. Um, then I want to also talk about uh, something which we did, which was quite interesting to inform the content of the questionnaires, which is what we did a, a four-step uh, foresight exercise, um, which is uh, quite prescient, I think, in relation to the kind of uh, uh, unpredictable events which we're all experiencing at the moment. Uh, and then finally, I want to talk about next steps, you know, so ha having taken it this far, um, what do we need to do to take it um, uh, further and to make sure that it uh, comes into being? So background then to begin with, um, where have we come from and why do we exist? Um, so I've been working on this for a number of years since around about uh, 2014, when we answered a call, a European uh, Commission uh, Framework 7 call, which asked the question, um, does Europe need uh, a longitudinal survey of child well-being? And is it uh, feasible? So is it desirable and is it feasible? We answered this call um, and we did that with the MyWeb project, which is an acronym which stands for uh, Measuring Youth Wellbeing. So we did a 30-month project um, involving a number of partners. Um, uh, you'll see some of who they are uh, shortly. Um, and, uh, and we we, we asked the question in, in, in a variety of ways to people across Europe, uh, professionals um, from well, policy professionals, researchers and practitioners. Uh, we did a Delphi survey and established that it is uh, very much desirable. Um, there is a perceived gap in data there, which people felt would be uh, important filled, importantly filled by such a survey. And perhaps equally important, it is doable. So um, through uh, surveying, uh, the right sort of uh, technical uh, methodologists, um, it was felt that such a survey could be done. Of course, we probably all know about the SHARE survey, the Survey of Health, Aging, Retirement in Europe, which um, is something I'll come back to later. And such a survey like that, if it can be done, why wouldn't we be able to do uh, a birth cohort um, uh, in the same vein? So that was the, that was the, um, the, the first uh, project that we did. Um, and it, and one, one more thing about that project. I think it's important to emphasize that it's, it was driven, the idea was driven by the European Commission. So it's a policy driven uh, project and we want to front stage that. You know, this is something which, uh, which, which, which Brussels came up with the idea or the people in DG Research and, and we've, we've responded to it and we, we agree it's a good idea, but let's not lose touch with the fact that um, it was the policymakers that, uh, that, that identified this gap um, in the first place. So we've completed that project, um, established that it was both desirable and doable, and we were then advised to take it further um, and actually um, think about how we could develop the, the design, the actual uh, research design. And so we, 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 we got another project, another European project um, called the European Cohort Development Project, ECDP. Um, and within that project, we did two things. One thing is that, is, is that we started off the uh, um, the, the establishment of the, the research design, which I'll be talking about shortly. But we also did uh, a lot of work in relation to um, establishing the business case, which is where we also start to lobby the, um, uh, the, the right people in, in terms of trying to secure the funding. Because as I'm sure you appreciate, the kind of funding which is required for a Europe-wide birth cohort study is, uh, is quite large. It's very large in, in social science terms. So there we are, uh, started with MyWeb, moved on to ECDP. The ECDP project um, co was completed at the end of uh, December, but the consortium carries on and we are doing a number of things, which I'll, which I'll come back to in the last section of the talk um, to show you uh, how, we are, uh, uh, hope, uh, how we are working towards Euro cohort coming into being. Um, so yes, in short, um, the, the Euro cohort uh, survey would provide uh, important data which doesn't currently exist, so it addresses a ga data gap. We are um, policy driven, and so the, the important, um, the data which we produce should always be uh, usable in relation to evidence-based policy making. We've established that it's doable, and uh, we also did a cost-benefit exercise where we uh, think we quite clearly showed that the um, benefits that uh, in terms of better policy making 
far exceed the costs that would um, nonetheless have to go into uh, collecting the data. Uh, on the right hand side of that slide, um, you can see a number of uh, scientific um, uh, priorities which we think uh, it also delivers. So while we're policy driven, it is nonetheless going to be a high quality scientific um, survey with multiple uses. And I've also included a quote by UNICEF on, on, on this slide as well, um, because I think it's important to note that we do get the backing of UNICEF. UNICEF have been involved with this from the outset as have Eurochild, um, and both of them are uh, very supportive in relation to uh, helping us to uh, take the project forwards. So um, we've been working with a number of uh, uh, partners across Europe um, uh, thus far, and uh, we are continually extending our reach. So if I can just show you on the map, the red countries are where we ha had presence for the MyWeb and for the ECDP projects. And we've extended, we're already extended outwards into other countries um, uh, as a result of what we've been doing and the interest that we've been uh, uh, receiving, uh, uh, people wanting to join in and uh, be part of what we're taking forward. So the green countries are the new ones and the red ones are the ones we've been working with already. Um, okay, uh, stepping back just a little bit for a moment um, and, and raising the question, well, why do we need this survey? There's a whole load of surveys out there already uh, across Europe, across the world, um, where uh, people are collecting longitudinally uh, child well-being information. And I've included just a few of them on this slide. Um, and the, the answer to that question is that, uh, of course, while these surveys are all great in their own right, um, many people have had a, a desire to, to compare them uh, for obvious reasons, you know, to, to see how far um, you know, what's happening in one country is also happening in another, how we can learn from one country in a different context. And um, because these, these surveys all have their own internal logic, their own uh, question banks, their own uh, methodologies for sampling, their, and, and their own unique timings when it comes to when people are in the field and the age group that's being surveyed, there are all sorts of problems when it comes to the harmonization of the data. So the only way you can really do the, the, this sort of comparative work is through post hoc harmonization. So the beauty of the Euro cohort project is to, is to through input harmonization, um, ensure that compar comparisons can truly be made both longitudinally, but more importantly, um, between countries. And so uh, what we try to show on this slide is, 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 is just that that on the left hand side, you know, we are, um, the Euro cohort is, it would be fully harmonized, it would be a common questionnaire with a common methodology rolled out to all participating countries, which would mean that um, it's, it's possible to, um, to easily, uh, more easily, uh, compare the data, unlike with the post harmonization methods, which are required for all uh, existing surveys. Um, Okay, so let's um, move on to the survey design. What is it that we are planning to do? How would we go about doing it? Um, and so I've got a few slides here just to show you the, uh, where we are with it um, uh, and uh, in relation to the, uh, the size of the samples, the, the, the frequency of data collection, um, and when we would hopefully be getting into the field as well. So starting off with um, a graph, um, what you can see first, there is that we are planning an accelerated cohort study. So we would go into the field firstly with an age eight cohort, um, which we would call C1. And then we would, uh, we would plan to survey that cohort every three years up until the age of uh, 24. Two years after that cohort goes into the field, we would plan to do a birth cohort, that is um, a postnatal uh, uh, birth cohort. Um, where, which we call C2, and you can see that we would, we would synchronize both of these cohorts. They actually get synchronized, obviously, from age eight, but, um, but the second cohort is um, surveyed every uh, two years after the first time, and then subsequently every three years. So what we've got there then is, um, is a structure which allows us to make direct comparisons between cohorts from the age of eight. Um, but because it's an accelerated cohort, it allows us to, to do some um, pseudo cohort comparisons before then. Um, okay, uh, a little, uh, just one, one uh, other thing about this 
um, this uh, graph is to mention that um, we did um, model doing it in a number of different ways with more frequent and less frequent data collections. And we've arrived at this as a, as a suitable uh, structure because it means that we are not constantly in the field. If we, if, if, we did it, if we did data collection every two years from each cohort, the testing and the field work for the actual waves for both cohorts would mean that we were constantly in the field with overlapping processes. And while there would be overlapping processes here, it's nonetheless more doable because we've got, uh, we've minimized the amount of uh, overlap be between the cohorts. So it's something which we feel is, uh, is a feasible proposition. Now, another thing it, you, you can see on this graph is that there are timings. Um, so projected to go into the field for the first cohort in 2022. Well, that would that was something which we were working with and have been working with up until this point. Um, of course, that's partly funding dependent, but it's nonetheless important to get a first impression of when we think we could have gone into the field. And um, some of the subsequent slides use this 2022 um, starting uh, time, but um, it's important to know that, of course, it, it could change, it probably would change and be later, and therefore all subsequent dates would also change. Okay, sampling design then. Um, so, uh, so the sample is, 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 is absolutely fundamental to the, the, the survey because it gives its, uh, its, uh, its scientific credibility. If, you, if you've got to get the sampling right, um, in order to draw the people in, draw the scientists in who are going to be interested in using uh, the data. So we will have a central sampling team, uh, much as other uh, international uh, surveys do, like, the, like Rory's ESS and like SHARE survey, and that sampling team will um, draw up the guidelines and principles and parameters by which the sampling will be done in each country. The most important principle of which is that it will be a probability sample, a high quality sample which, will, uh, which, which can withstand um, uh, inferential statistical analysis. Uh, but of course, because we're dealing with different sort of legal contexts, different countries, different population distributions and so forth, the actual samples which will be done in each country will be quite different. But the, so, so although the, the, the sampling the sampling will be different between country. There will be commonly prescribed um, uh, methods and, and commonly, dis, uh, commonly prescribed uh, levels of statistical precision uh, with which uh, the, the sample must comply. And um, and just, yes, of course, we can, uh, samples can be uh, clustered um, and, and there will be, uh, that can be acceptable. Okay, uh, moving on and thinking about the population coverage. So, um, uh, assuming that the, the first, the first um, cohort would be in the field of 2022, then we've given an indication of what that first cohort, the birth dates of that, that, that first cohort would be there. They would run from the 1st of September 2013 um, to the 31st of August in 2014, and that would give us the, the age eight cohort, age eight, age eight and three months. Um, and so what the important point to make here is that we're doing full year sampling. So, uh, so it's important methodologically, uh, scientifically, to have uh, a representative um, uh, section of population throughout the year, because we know that so many effects for young people are uh, dependent upon uh, the, the month in which you're born. So it's not just about achieving a sample within a particular time scale without um, uh, and being less interested in the months the actual months of the data collection are important. And similarly for the second cohort, it's a full year, um, a full year window with, for, the, for, the, for the sample to take place. <clears throat> In terms of the sample size, um, the, uh, most crucially, uh, you know, we're a, we're a relatively, it's, it's a longitudinal project, and we would want to survey people up to the age of 24 at least. Um, and so the sample sizes have got to be large enough to, um, to be, uh, representative even at the end of that process taking into account uh, attrition so um, much of the work that we've done has been looking at uh, expected uh, attrition rates and then uh, at, uh, arriving at sample sizes which we believe will be um, sufficiently large uh, across all of the participating countries and as you can see there the um, sample sizes that we have uh, arrived at are for the age 8 cohort um, uh, 8,000 and for the uh, birth cohort, 10,000. Um, and 
uh, also, of course, because some countries have got much smaller uh, populations for which those, those figures would be far too large uh, and, and small birth rates, that, uh, that, that there is a, a waiver that, um, that uh, these numbers could be 5,000 for the uh, birth cohort and 4,000 for the infant cohort in such countries. But we wouldn't want to go any lower than that because to go any lower than that, you know, we don't want a sliding scale because uh, it's important that there is, that for statistic, statistical comparability, that, um, that, that, that such sample sizes uh, need to be uh, adhered to. Okay, so that's, that's it in terms of, uh, that's all I want to say in relation to the sample. And so I want to uh, move on now and talk uh, a little bit about the, the questionnaire content. So what I'm gonna talk about is, uh, first of all, how we went about um, establishing the, uh, the, the content process uh, we, we went through. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the thematic areas and give you a few examples of uh, some of the questions which we've got, uh, examples of the questions for the children, because I think that's probably the most relevant uh, uh, thing to, to, to look at here. So in terms of the, uh, the process that we've used um, for content selection, uh, sorry, for the, for the questionnaire, it's first of all thinking about the generic content uh, that we would want to have there, um, then prioritizing it, uh, thinking about what's most important, and then looking at the particular items which we want to need. Um, we, we had a consultative process with all of our partners, um, and then um, and, and, and then we've we've started to construct a long term plan. We've not got uh, we've not got into the piloting and the translation parts of it yet. Um, uh, and we've so we, we do have draft questionnaires now. In all likelihood, these questionnaires are going to be too large. Um, there is going to be a need to cut them down. But we've already done some of that sort of selection throughout this this process. Um, in relation to how we went about establishing the, uh, the, the content, um, we had four main content drivers. Uh, policy makers, of course, because we're policy driven. Scientists, because of course scientists need to be involved, got to get these things right. Existing survey instruments, because uh, there's a lot of work done out there already with uh, uh, question banks which have, are well tested, and so we certainly would plan to use those. Um, but perhaps um, something which doesn't routinely happen with all surveys but really ought to is that we are using children and young people and um, we're consulting them we will have a number of fora that we will we will be consulting children and young people uh, in terms of uh, uh, questionnaire content but actually more widely than that but more about that later Uh, when we were looking at uh, all of the different uh, questions, um, we felt that it would, there was a need for criteria um, that all questions would have to uh, achieve uh, in, in relation to actually being selected. Uh, and these are listed on this slide here, where we again assert the importance of poli uh, policy relevance. Of course, things have to be longitudinally relevant within a, a longitudinal survey. The, the, we need to be multidisciplinary. It's not just it's not good enough just to be focused on education or psychology. It's important for uh, the economists uh, uh, and the um, and sociologists um, and, and so forth to 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 be able to see and the demographers to be able to see that there's important data in there, um, such that we've got to maximise the user base. Um, uh, it's a funding issue partly, of course. Um, international comparability, yes, I mean, it, it, we any particular uh, concept or question for which there, there could very well be particular problems when it comes to international comparability doesn't pass that test, then it really ought not to be included. And then fin finally, of course, um, the, back to this issue of child centricity, we want as far as possible to ensure that we adhere to uh, a principle of child centricity, uh, and that comes that that, that that's included not just by consulting children in questionnaires and the, the methods and so forth, but also in, in, in thinking about um, how we approach um, questions about child well-being that we might be asking parents, you know, so if given the choice between who should we ask the question to, you know, uh, uh, parent or child, maybe we do both, uh, but how do we value, uh, value that, uh, uh, value the answers from each. And that's sort of partly where this slide's going as well. You know, um, making it, it, when looking at the questions, you know, we would identify the topics, think about exactly uh, at what age it would be relevant, and then establish who would be the right person to ask. And where a child can be asked something, we our view is that they certainly should be asked. You know, parents will give us a whole load of information 
um, which is important and relevant, and I've got a slide on that later, but uh, there is a principle where uh, the, the, if, if the child can, can, uh, can answer a question, we should, um, we should certainly be listening to their response. So, so this child centricity does come from a belief in that, you know, at age eight, um, child, children do have the cognitive capacity to be able to talk about uh, their own well-being, to talk about their own experiences, to talk about um, their lives, and to, to, to give us, if we ask the questions in the right way, that, um, that, we, that we can actually interpret that data uh, appropriately. And that's something which we've been working with right back from the MyWeb days, is involving children in the research process. So with the MyWeb project, we did a whole lot of cognitive testing because we, what we wanted to assert was uh, the age at which we felt that this cognitive capacity was certainly there. And so we did, we pushed it down to seven um, in, in the cognitive testing, which we did. We did it in six different countries in MyWeb. Um, um, but it was it was becoming problematic. So so at, at, while we know that, for example, the Millennium Cohort Survey asks children questions at age seven, the kind of questions that we want to ask to do with, for example, uh, subjective well-being, um, we feel are more appropriately at, appropriately asked at uh, age eight. Um, the importance of child centricity, of course, is also there in relation to the fact that um, we really do need to build children into the process. These policies which uh, people are going to be using the data for will have a direct impact on children. So the more we involve children in, uh, in the research process, we feel is actually going to be is going to enhance the, the, the policy uh, development process. Um, and so I, I've already mentioned this to some extent that it's not just about informing the content of the questionnaires. The children's voice is something which we will be uh, listening to in relation to instrument development, but also data collection modes and fieldwork strategies. So um, we, we have had throughout and we will continue to have um, uh, children and young people's advisory groups. I think we call them youth advisory boards uh, now, but, uh, but you know, we've got We've got various means by which we will be uh, involving children, young people in uh, all aspects of the survey process. Okay, so child centricity is a, a priority for us, but of course it's important that um, uh, that we do ask uh, parents questions. That there's a, for the child, for the baby cohort, of course we can only ask parents, but it's important for us to think about what kind of information we're getting from the parents or what, what we can do with it. Um, it, of course, there's objective uh, context, background information, and so forth, but also there's the parents' perceptions about uh, a child's well-being, a baby's well-being, and so, uh, so forth. Um, but uh, what we really do not want is to be asserting that a child, uh, that a parent's perception of a child's well-being is an uh, is uh, directly analogous to the child's well-being. It's it, it, we've, we've got to think of it as a separate. Uh, uh, a separate, um, uh, a separate thing, something which is important for analysis, but what, which is not a substitute or a proxy for, uh, for the children's perspective. Uh, in relation to the item selection, yes, we, 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 we went around, looked, looked at a lot of surveys, um, um, many more surveys than are listed here, but uh, the, the, important, the importance for us was you know, to use as far as possible uh, readily tested uh, questions so um, where we, you can see you can see uh, longitudinal surveys there uh, uh, as well as cross-sectional surveys the children's world survey is a cross-sectional survey that we're very close to they've been involved with us from the outset and they're very good in relation to uh, particularly in relation to uh, comparability of questions being asked of children um, in in different uh, uh, cultures languages and contexts um, while we to some extent, mainly our uh, Anglo, uh, English driven uh, survey. Um, the Children's World Survey has done a lot of work in starting off concepts in uh, non-English languages and seeing how far they get translated into English. We think that that's a very exciting thing that we should be putting more uh, effort into. Um, they often, they, the, the example that they used once was, what was it? Um, uh, a question that, which, which came out of, uh, I think, North Africa, French North Africa, how satisfied are you with your emotional well-being? Now that makes perfect sense in many cultures, but in English it sounds a bit peculiar. Um, so it's important that uh, it's important for us to, to be thinking about concepts, not just translating outwards from English, but also inwards to English, and how we might have to deal with that. Um, 
Okay, so yes, so it, in relation to the process of, of selecting the questions, you know, we we had we had uh, we looked at all these uh, items. We tried to check on anglocentric tendencies. Uh, we got our partners to uh, rate the relative importance of each of the items uh, and give us any for any other notes and to identify any, any identify any particular gaps. So that was how we we uh, used the, uh, our partner our consortium partners in relation to defining what should be put into the questionnaires. And what we came out with um, is for each of three questionnaires, a list of uh, uh, 10 main thematic areas. So what we've got uh, are three questionnaires, uh, three draft questionnaires, um, two questionnaires for the child cohort, um, one for the child, one for the parent, and then one questionnaire for the um, for the, uh, the, the parent of the baby. Now, going into a little bit more depth, as I promised earlier, I want to show you just some of the, the questions that we've got that, uh, for, the, for the children to, to, to give you an idea of the kind of questions that we would uh, foresee asking. So the main thematic areas there, as you can see, are listed, starting with subjective well-being and f finishing off with uh, children's rights. Um, and so just as an example of the, uh, a question that we would use, which has been adapted from the Children's Society on subjective well-being, which allow us to develop a, a, a subjective well-being scale. So we would, we would have a, 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 a Likert type answer structure for, this, uh, for, for these, uh, these different items. And you can see uh, the, different, um, the, different, uh, the different items there to do with my life is going well, my life is just right, et cetera, et cetera. So, so subjective well-being is captured using that uh, bank of questions. Then um, something which is taken from the uh, uh, International Survey of Children's Wellbeing, the ISWEB survey, um, in relation to family uh, relationships, again, where we're looking to um, develop a, uh, a scale uh, which help us to understand uh, a child's perspective on family relationships, for which you can see uh, the, the different items there. I don't propose to read them all out. Um, time use, uh, a, a very important um, aspect uh, in relation to you know, understanding exactly what would be um, what would be uh, what what young what children are doing, um, what they prioritise. Um, uh, and we've done a number, we've done some testing in relation to what would be the appropriate answer structures for for these uh, time use questions as well, because we know that uh, for eight year old children, for some eight year old children, concepts of time are actually quite problematic. So we've got to be very precise about uh, how we go about uh, giving them the answer structures for those. Um, a feeling safe scale, um, because we know that uh, one of the important uh, um, concepts that we need to get on top of, uh, make sure that we represent is, uh, is safety um, and things to do with bullying in school and so forth. And then finally, um, uh, in relation to the children's questionnaire, an example of how we would go about, or we could go about, uh, and we're planning to go about, uh, asking children about uh, their own rights. So, so what we pr propose to do there is to present to the children with a, a vignette and ask them about the extent to which they agree or not with it. So Betty is nine years old, she keeps a diary, and she has said that nobody else should read it, not even her parents. Her parents insist that they should be allowed to see her secret diary. Betty should have the right to keep her secret diary. Do you agree or disagree? So, uh, human right, our children's rights, is is something which we feel is something which is not really adequately represented in many surveys, and perhaps not enough, certainly in the, in the birth cohort surveys. Okay, so that's it for the um, uh, for the, all I want to say about the content of the children's survey. Um, and now, of course, we will be asking a significant number of questions of the. Um, uh, the parents' uh, children, so the parents' uh, the children's parents, and, um, uh, and and that will be giving us a lot of value, in, valuable information, which will understand as the understand the help us understand the context within which these uh, children are being brought up and uh, within which their lives are unfolding, and so the parents' questions will will be certainly giving us that objective circumstances type of uh, information but we will also be asking them about their subjective evaluations so while we do prioritize the voice of the child we do understand that it's important to be able to to, to understand what the perspective of the parent is in relation to what's going on in, in the, the household as well um, uh, and and in relation to as with all um, uh, as with all uh, longitudinal surveys 
you know, we, we're looking very closely at those questions which we will, we need to ask at wave one and which will not be asked uh, subsequently. And those, um, those uh, questions which we would be expecting to ask at, uh, at uh, uh, every, every wave uh, in order to uh, confirm and reconfirm uh, stability or instability in relation to a number of uh, factors. And I think the next slide, to some extent, yes, we go into that there. So if we if we think about parental employment here, um, you know, th there are some things that we would be uh, asking just at wave one, um, uh, things to do with uh, employment, uh, parents and mother, mothers and fathers' uh, employment status, um, uh, the the uh, first jobs and so forth. And then in subsequent waves, there'll be a series of questions that we would be asking, and we would be asking them uh, and getting them reconfirmed uh, every wave. Standard practice for uh, longitudinal surveys, of course. Um, and um, I think this is just reiterating that uh, that uh, we we are interested in uh, parents' uh, uh, ideas, perspectives, views of uh, uh, of the child as they grow up before the the uh, age eight before the time at which we would be asking the children the questions. So it does give us uh, valuable, valuable information. Okay, um, so that's that's all I propose to say in relation to the, the, the question questionnaire content uh, in relation to the, the, the parents. We have got um, uh, an idea of the longer term plan as well. So we've got what we've we've drafted everything for wave one for waves two to nine we've drafted what the themes will be uh, and so while i know you won't be able to see the content of that um uh that that matrix uh, there maybe it will work if you expand it um it, it's certainly something which is available uh, uh in, in public public documents um and uh and um and you can see there that uh, that while we've not got questions mapped out for the for the subsequent waves, we've certainly got the themes. And uh, this graph is, or this this slide is just showing you the cluster of uh, cluster of uh, of themes that we will be covering throughout the course of the uh, the, 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 the the nine waves. Okay, I just want to very briefly because I can see that I'm at 39 minutes past six, and I think it one of 45 minutes schedule. So um, uh, I've still got a number of slides to go, but I wanted to just talk briefly about the something we did, which was uh, interesting, quite exciting, which was the foresight exercise. So one thing we were very keen to do was to ensure that we future proof the, um, the content of the survey, because as we know, it's very important with, uh, with these surveys to get the right questions asked at wave one. Um, because the, you know the, the, there's nothing worse than regretting uh, that you missed something uh, which, which really ought to have been there, but also trying to think about you know what uh, you know what the future is going to hold and what that, what the implications are in relation to uh, uh, the process of collecting survey data. And I think that we're all going to be thinking about that in different ways now, given what's been happening uh, across the world over the past couple of months. Um, but, um, but but in relation to what we did, um, what we were, we were keen to identify what we thought would be future policy trends, um, uh, establish what the priority areas would be, and um, and, and future proof our, our survey as far as possible. How do we do that? Well, we, what we did was we did some um, work with uh, uh, people across Europe, uh, policymakers, uh, scientists, um, people we called signal spotters, people who were well placed to um, to uh, identify what the potential future trends might be, uh, future drivers for policy and so forth. Um, and we enlisted them and we undertook a series of surveys with them uh, and, and then used the results of those, uh, the, the, the work that they gave us in the, in the surveys um, to uh, establish a number of scenarios that we felt, you know, plausible future scenarios, which would help us to understand um, the way the world is moving in different ways and how we maybe should be thinking about the content of our questionnaire accordingly. Um, who did we use? We used uh, policymakers, research experts, NGOs, um, youth commentators, but also young people themselves. Uh, what were the kind of things which came back to us? A lot of it is quite predictable. Um, you know, that um, in a child-centered uh, uh, society, global challenges, digitization, the increasing polarization of inequality, uh, 
uh, quality of life and work. But the two uh, big ones, the, 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 the two themes which, were, which came back most strongly were that of contested science um, and the new world of politics. So a lot of what, we kept, what we've been experiencing over the past four years with um, you know, increasing levels of uh, a different form of politics, a lot of it which is manifest in, in populist terms, um, uh, across across the world, certainly across Europe, but also the way in which science has been increasingly questioned. Um, uh, uh, let's see how far that persists in relation to the importance of science in getting on top of this uh, uh, COVID-19. But um, but certainly up until this point, uh, the, the science has been brought into question. And so what we did with that is we we um, we mapped these two um, these two uh, new world of politics and contested science mapped them. Uh, in a matrix uh, where where what we we, we felt we, we we could we could differentiate uh, uh, different futures where where they could be embracing science or being suspicious of science on the one hand, uh, and then political uh, futures where the the world is becoming increasingly interconnected. The, the globalization continues at a pace, or that um, that uh, nations become more inward looking, less interested in globalization and so forth, uh, and, the, and, and things become more fragmented. Um, and, and in relation to that, we then came out with these different, uh, these different uh, themes which we felt reflected those, uh, where nations would have to become more resourceful, um, where high tech futures would be, uh, um, would be uh, predicted and so forth. And then with those, with each of those different futures, we then um, mapped out different types of storylines um, for children and the implications that that then would have on how we should be collecting data. Now, um, I can't talk about all of that now, but I've put on this slide a link to the URL of the report, which captures this um, foresight exercise. That's as much as I want to say now, but it was a very interesting thing for us to do, and it did help us uh, focus uh, our minds a little bit on the content of some of the questionnaires. Okay, last section of the talk now um, is next steps. So we've, um, so we've, we've, uh, we've got our uh, research design, we've got our questionnaires, um, we've got a lot of people very excited about it. Um, it needs a phenomenal amount of money. Um, how do we get that? How do we, how do we, how do we achieve what we want to achieve? Um, well, what, what we need to be doing is, is looking around and, uh, and, and trying to, to bring the Euro cohort into being uh, through a, a variety of uh, activities. Um, funding, of course, is, is, uh, is always the, the, the big thing. Um, and, the, and the EU has been very helpful because it's given us two projects already. And we will be applying for a, a third project, as is listed there, a starting communities project, um, which I'll say more about in a minute. Uh, building the network, as I mentioned earlier, we are co constantly building outwards, getting more partners and ensuring that those partners are the right people to help us to get the funding. Then there's something called the European Strategy Forum for Research Infrastructures, which I know a lot of you know a lot about, but maybe some people don't know about it. Um, but there is a, a roadmap for new research, uh, infra or fledgling nascent new research infrastructures, which we would like to be included on. And then finally, it's the preparation phase. How, how do we get up and running? You know, what, what, what are the next phases that we need to uh, take? So a little bit, a little bit about each of these, and then um, I shall be almost done. So the Infra IA Starting Communities Grant um, helps us to do uh, three things. It helps us to build our network a bit further. It helps us to enhance the access to existing data. And it helps us to in, initiate some of the uh, piloting that we, um, that we would want to be doing to help the, the Euro cohort start. So, so this is a, the Infra IA starting communities. It's a, it's a call within Horizon 2020, which gives um, uh, a, a consortium the ability to do what well, you have to do each of these three things. You've got to be building a network. So the starting community is to do with the importance of cohort uh, surveys and so forth. Um, and uh, uh, we, we need to be talking, showing how what we're doing is important uh, in relation to accessing existing data but you're allowed to do joint research as well. And so that's where we think we can uh, uh, credibly uh, ask for money to kick off uh, the, the, some of the preparatory work for your cohort. Network building, um, well, we've already got our core scientific team, people we've been working with for a number of years. 
Um, national scientific contacts, as I've said, we're building outwards already. We've got uh, the, the new partners, uh, new interest in a, a range of different countries, and I've listed some of them there. And these are people who are well placed within their countries uh, to get the kind of funding which is needed to influence the policy makers, the national funding councils and so forth um, to, uh, to uh, bring us into being. And then the, the S3 roadmap. Okay, the European Strategy Forum for Research Infrastructures. There, the, the, there's a number of uh, projects, social science projects on it already. There's the SHARE survey, the ESS, uh, and, and uh, in, in particular, the says there is another social science research infrastructure, and we want Eurocorp to get onto this roadmap. So what they have is uh, what they call a life, life cycle approach to research infrastructures, which starts with the concept development, uh, number one at the top there, and uh, that was our MyWeb project, so we established the concept. Number two on this roadmap, uh, uh, this life cycle, is, is uh, the design study, which, we, which was our ECDB project. And now what we want to be doing is moving forward to this preparation phase. Uh, and that, that, in order to, to, to achieve that, we need to get onto this roadmap. So we will be submitting to get onto the S3 roadmap later in the year. There's a submission process already in motion. And uh, this slide is just to, to show people that we are close to, working with, have been very helpful to us. Uh, of course, the European Social Survey, Rory was part of the ECDB project um, and provided a lot of valuable information uh, to us in relation to, not just in relation to the surveys, but also in relation to the lobbying and the politics of, uh, of, of these European uh, initiatives. The SHARE survey, as I've mentioned a few times, um, uh, already a research infrastructure, been in operation for some time, show that it is possible to do something as ambitious and complex as we were planning to do. Um, and then there's the Generations in Gender program, uh, 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 all, an existing research infrastructure across the world, also trying to get onto the roadmap. So we're working with each of these and um, we, we, we feel that, um, that uh, the Euro cohort is well placed to be included in, uh, in, in that family of, uh, of international comparative surveys. What we've done is uh, myself, Tom Emery and Annette Sherp and Zeal um, have drafted a policy brief within the Population Europe uh, policy brief series uh, for which I've given the URL there and within this we argue that uh, all three of our surveys are needed so Tom is a, a leading scientist in the generations and gender program and at Sherpin Zeal is the international coordinator of the SHARE survey and so SHARE does 50 upwards GGP if I can simplify things does 18 to 50 our survey would do birth up to the GGP survey so all three surveys together give valuable important demographic data which is important it's essential for policymakers to do what they need to do at the moment there's a gap there's a gap because there's no systematic comparable longitudinal surveys for um uh, uh babies and uh, children young people and then finally the preparation phase then so we were hoping that we will get to do the, the preparation work partly through the infra ia project if we win it and also in relation to getting onto the roadmap. Um, but we will, we will continue nonetheless, um, whatever happens, because we feel that it's possible in, in any case to be securing support uh, from, we're already getting support from uh, governments in different countries in Europe. And so we, we, given that we've already established what we need to do in relation to bringing the survey into being, we will work with the most committed partners um, and actually start initiating the pilot phases as are listed here and and we will will continue to approach new potential partners um, and show as we're going about that piloting that uh, they should um, they, they should join us um, and you know the, the, the more work that we do the more we actually show that it, it is possible it's doable and it's important and it's it's uh, exciting and, work, and workable um, we, we fully predict that uh, we will get more countries coming on board. So that's uh, a graphic then to show what we, where we're where we hoping to be in the future. So we've come from MyWeb back from 2000, 2013 to 16 through ECDP um, and hopefully the S3 preparation phase if we can get onto that, that the roadmap. Um, and then finally we will become growing up in digital Europe. Um, at some point in the future and, and survey people up until the age of 24 and so uh, this will be well past my retirement date 
um, but uh, uh, well, at least I hope it will be. Um, uh, we will be surveying up until around about 2050. So uh, thank you all for indulging me in uh, talking about uh, uh, the project I've been working on for uh, some time, for many years so far. 